Hello, everyone. GM, GM. Welcome back to another episode of Overpriced JPEGs. I am so excited about today's episode and our guest. Here on the pod, I have Herman Narula, who is the founder of Improbable, whose name you might have been hearing recently because Improbable is the company behind Yuga Labs' other side metaverse. So all of that crowing all over Twitter that you were seeing about how impressive it was that there were 4,500 people in an experience all at once, interacting seamlessly. That is all the work of Herman's company, Improbable. We are, of course, going to talk all about that. Herman, you are also the author of a book, Virtual Society, that is coming out in October. Do I have that right? Absolutely. Plug in your book for you here, you know, right, right up front. You're making me smile straight away. I'm like, okay, let's get some, let's get some book sales. I like to make my guests comfortable, you know, easy into this. Uh, so, of course, we're going to talk broadly about the metaverse. I think you have an interesting definition for it and different, uh, an interesting way you approach it. Get a little technical here, really understand, get under the hood, understand how you're doing, what you're doing for other side. And the other work you've done, it's fascinating. You have done a, a lot of virtual world work for like governments and, and militaries. So I really want to talk about all of that. Before we do, we have to hear a word from our lovely, lovely sponsors. Immutable X is the layer two platform for crypto gaming. Immutable offers massive scalability with up to 9,000 transactions per second and instant transaction confirmation. No more gas fees, no more waiting around for your transaction to clear. Immutable's zero knowledge roll up finally unlocks the world of crypto gaming. Immutable X is the only gas free NFT minting platform with over 26 million NFTs minted, all with zero gas fees. With the power of Immutable, gaming developers don't also need to become smart contract developers, they just need to plug in to Immutable's API and instant instantly start unlocking the full potential of crypto assets inside of games. This is why world-class companies and projects have decided to deploy on Immutable X like GameStop, Ember Sword, Planet Quest, Alluvium, TikTok, and many more behind the scenes. So start building your game on Immutable X today at immutable.com. There is a brand new staking feature in the Ledger Live app today. We all like staking the assets that we're bullish on, and now you can stake seven different coins inside the Ledger Live app. Cosmos, Polkadot, Tron, Algorand, Tezos, Solana, and of course, Ethereum. With Ledger Live, you can take money from your bank account, buy your most bullish crypto asset, and stake that asset to its network, all inside the Ledger Live app. Through a partnership with Figment, Ledger also lets you choose which validator you want to stake your assets with. And Ledger is running its own validating nodes, offering a convenient way to participate in network validation, and it even comes with slashing insurance. Ledger Live is truly becoming the battle station for the bankless world, so go download Ledger Live. If you have a ledger already, you probably already have it and get started securely staking your crypto assets. Okay, Herman, let's start here. Um, the book, your, your book, Virtual Worlds, isn't out yet, but I was wondering if you could give us a, a sneak preview of maybe what your highest order thesis for that book is. Sure. I'm guessing that'll get us into your maybe unique thoughts on the metaverse. Sure. I think a lot of techies and thinkers and pundits that we've all heard from in the last sort of year or two, and a couple of books have even come out this year, they define the metaverse as basically a progression of the internet and video games. And the idea behind that theory is that we're all going to be basically spending time in some kind of interconnected network of video games. And naturally, that's created an enormous amount of skepticism and bafflement from a lot of people. I think not least the people who make video games, because they're like, we already have interconnected virtual world. <laughs> like, you know, I think if I were- Like metaverse Roblox, done, Roblox, what are you talking about? Like, yeah, it's like, what are, you, what are you talking about? You know, and, and some of the sort of quote unquote metaverses that we've seen in the last year don't even seem like compelling video games 10 years ago, right? If not for the financialization of crypto, you know, a lot of these projects, I won't name names, but you know, the, the sort of top two, three crypto metaverse projects have less than- a thousand peak CCU on a daily basis, something like that in some cases. So there are actually more people that work at my company that play, that then play on a daily basis, some yeah. of these, which is kind of crazy in, 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 you know, in, 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 to see projects that are worth billions. So then I guess the reason I wrote the book is because I think the metaverse is a much bigger, more important idea than just the next kind of marketing direction for Facebook. And I think it also predates technology and even the internet in a really profound way. And I might be wrong, but my basic thesis is that we have always lived in, in a sense, the real world and these other worlds. And if you're a big sports fan, you probably know what I mean. Like sports is like this other world where the mm. things that happen there really matter to the real world, even though they don't really matter at all, right? It doesn't really matter who wins the World Cup, but it affects geopolitics. It doesn't really matter who kicks a ball into a net, but it makes global celebrities that then, you know, become 
fund it for fashion brands and style icons and other things. Culture, music, stories, uh, other worlds, these have always been a really fundamental part of our lives. So the first, the first thing that I put forward in the book is that this isn't entertainment. This is actually just an extension of the way we conduct our society. And the things that happen in these other worlds, they're actually important to the real world. And this is why, um, for me, the metaverse is not an extension of video games, which are a closed loop of entertainment and fun. I love video games and, you know, my company supports many video games businesses. I think the metaverse is something different. It's an extension of culture. It's a collection of virtual experiences and a network of meaningful events, people, objects, and things that extend our society. And the things that happen in the metaverse matter differently to the things that happen in ordinary video games because they can come right back and affect you in the real world, affect society and affect other experiences as well. So this notion of the metaverse is a network of meaningful and fulfilling experiences mediated through the transfer of value between those experiences and between the real world makes it an extension of our culture. And why is it a good thing? Why is it better than what we already have? You know, there are a couple of really exciting elements to it. I think one really exciting element is it opens up the possibility for really interesting and powerful experiences, which wouldn't be commercially or practically viable in video games, but become very viable within the construct of a metaverse. So one really great example is, you know, massive stadiums of people hanging out together, socializing with a celebrity or with each other. Like if you're a sort of, you know, Manchester United fan in Southeast Asia, you've never been to a game. I can put you in a game with all these other fans screaming and shouting and interacting together. So these, these mass scale social events and these mm. more one-off or, or persistent, but more socially driven experiences, which aren't traditionally games, you don't necessarily win or lose them, although they can have gameplay mechanics and which don't require attention. That's a really important new opportunity that metaverse technology and interconnected experiences where value can be shared is shown off. I think the other really crucial thing I would say is the metaverse and crypto are just like any sane vision of the metaverse deeply meshes in crypto and web three. And the reason is because it's all about the transfer of value in and out of these experiences. That's what starts to make them viable. How does that celebrity hanging out with their fans sell t-shirts that then mean anything outside of that experience? How do I in the real world, you know, get bring the community that I created in, 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 in kind of the metaverse to have meaningful power in the real world? And this is, again, how they're different from video games. Superficially, you look at a video game and, the, and, and people's idea of the metaverse and you're like, hey, it's like a video game, but VR, but worse. But as you go deeper, you start to see, you know, where it can go. And finally, with the book, I go a little bit crazy, um, you know, in the last couple of chapters where I posit that, you know, as we, as we get ever more fulfilling experiences, ever more important and interesting things that happen in these other realities, I think we're set up as a species to, to really start exploring these other worlds and investing in these other worlds and enriching our lives with these other worlds in really exciting ways for the future. I mean, there's a lot of doom and gloom about the future for a lot of reasons. And I think part of it is that our society generates so much crap and consumerism <laughs> that is really bad for the environment and doesn't necessarily generate a lot of value for people in, in, in a very fulfilling way. I'm hopeful the metaverse is a much more efficient way of creating value for millions of people around the world mm. without all that way. Well, it's it, that, uh, there's so much there to unpack. Uh, just taking that last point you made. I also think, you know, bad news sells. So w when we when we see news about social media, it's always negative. It's about all of the the genuinely negative consequences of the social media world we live in. But how many of us, if given a magic wand and asked if we would you know eliminate social media from the world, would actually do that? Or how many of us actually wish it had never been created? But we don't focus on the aspects of it that are enriching our lives. We see the news every day about you know mental health concerns and, and all of those things are super valid, but um, there's always positives and neg negatives to everything. You preempted one of my questions by by talking about how critical crypto and, and I think NFTs as an extension are to this new world. We'll probably dive a little bit more into that. But I want to push on this question around, this is an extension of real experiences, because I love that definition as somebody who's not a gamer. I've never been particularly compelled by the idea of like, I'm just going to run around gaming all the time because that's not what I do right now in my life. So these social experiences feel like they're much more in line with what I'm interested in. But do you think, is there a detraction at all if you're hanging out with your favorite celebrity, but they don't look like the celebrity you know? Like if I'm hanging out with Reese Witherspoon, but she doesn't look like Reese Witherspoon, will that really be as 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 popular? Or is there a psychological shift that's going to happen for all of us where 
we are so accustomed to those kinds of experiences that they feel just as exciting and just as compelling to us as a real world experience would. So I think that's a really good question. And it kind of is a, another version of the question, is a virtual experience a real experience? Mm. And I think what we can touch on is what I, I wrote my book in is the idea of self-determination theory. I love this branch of psychology and I encourage everyone to check it out. It's about 30 years old with research that has been pretty conclusive, to be honest, at this point. And the idea behind it is that what we crave, what we need as human beings is a fulfilling experiences. These are experiences that involve us actually doing things. And in those experiences, we're usually getting fulfilled in one of three ways competence, which is the feeling of getting better at something. So when Roger Federer, like, you know, beats somebody at tennis, you know, his feeling of competence improves, right? Or autonomy, which is the feeling of making meaningful choices. So if you're like playing the Witcher and you're making a decision about, you know, a particular path, your feeling of autonomy is increasing, right? And similarly with relatedness, which is not socializing, it's the feeling of meaning something to other people. And what's interesting is these are not optional. These are not entertainment. These are not things you do when you're bored. If you do not get these things from your workplace, from your life, from the experiences that you have available to you, real psychological harm happens to you. You feel mm. disaffected. You feel like your life is meaningless. You feel like, you know, you, you're with some people who feel like they're born in the wrong time or don't have the, the ability to mean something in this world. And similarly, there's no limit to how fulfilling your life can be, to how profoundly meaningful your experiences can be. So, in order to give fulfillment to as many people as possible, virtual experiences present a really, really incredible way of doing that. And what's interesting is that the parts of the experience that are necessary for them to be fulfilling are nothing to do with realism. So companies like Facebook are hyper-focused on realism, right? How real does the world look? And if I'm in VR, then maybe it feels more real. I'm more immersed. Actually, that doesn't seem to be how human beings work. While realism is awesome, and I hope that you know they crack it and it becomes a cool part of the experience, what's much more important is presence, the feeling that your actions matter, that the things you do mean something in the world. It's no accident that some of the biggest games in the last couple of years, Fortnite, Minecraft, they actually look a lot uglier than games made 10 years before. Mm. Those companies sacrifice graphics because they, didn't, they realized that people didn't care so much how it looked. They cared more about the gameplay. They cared more about the actual opportunities to, to have to take interesting actions and have interesting experiences in the world. So when you look at things that way, a K-pop concert in the metaverse, which we put on last year with, with Alexa, who just won the American Song Contest and thousands of her fans, it wasn't about the fact that they were, gonna, they were there to hear her sing. It was about the fact that she and them, and there's videos on YouTube I encourage people to check out, could kind of connect in a way that they couldn't do in a real stadium. You know, everyone flooded the stage and jumped on top of her and she started laughing and like grew into a giant size and threw people around and identified people in a particular name. You couldn't really do that in the real world. You know, you're just going to be one person blaring, uh, like, you know, you know, waving your phone from the back. You know, you're never going to get the opportunity to interact. So that back and forth interaction is really powerful. You sort of see it a little bit with Twitch streamers right now and YouTubers who are a little bit more like back and forth with their audience, but this can supercharge it to another level. Well, it's also striking to me that what we've seen in the last, I don't know, I guess you could argue decade or something, is this losing trust in institutions, losing trust in the things that look super highly produced, you know, call it cable news stations or or anything that, that feels really polished, and a rise in podcasters and people like sitting in their homes where there's this almost authenticity there. Yeah. You know, it, 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 I was thinking of that as you're talking about how like Roblox is more popular now, even though it looks, you know, less beautiful than whatever. Yeah. Grand Theft Auto or whatever yeah. came, you know, prior to it. Um, how focused are you on the realism question? It, it sounded like you're like kind of leaving that to, to meta. <laughs> well, well, it's more, I want things to look incredibly beautiful. So we, we do everything we can to make the worlds that we're working on beautiful. And you can use VR with our technology. In fact, our technology has been used more for VR games than people realize. Some of the biggest VR games um, of the last year or two, things like Zenith, started off on our old technology, Spatial OS, not on new stuff, uh, Morpheus, which other side is powered by. So it's all viable. We, we don't in any way limit the graphical fidelity of worlds. And I think a lot of our content can be, can be at the top end of what any engine can produce. But... I just don't think that's going to be the most popular content. I think the most popular content is going to be the content that gives people in the most accessible experience possible. Like we went out of our way to ensure that um, you could use a phone connection with just a 350 kilobits per second bandwidth to access our world when you download the client. So with other side, we did streaming, but you can actually download the client. Because I'm really keen that like, I don't know, I'm from India. So the idea of like somebody who's like driving a truck in India and loves cricket, 
could pull out their phone and just on a 3G connection, for the first time in their entire life, go to a cricket match, you know, with fans in the UK and fans in India, speak with their own voice, everybody shouting and chanting. They're actually having their voice heard. They're part of this experience. And that creates an incredible level of fulfillment that I don't think is going to become more fulfilling or less fulfilling depending on how realistic the characters around them look, but it will be more or less fulfilling depending upon how much they feel like those people are real people who are interacting with them. So graphics are important. They're part of the question, but the focus here is presence, not immersion. Immersion is how real you think the world is. Presence is how real the world thinks you are. And that's the most important. Oh, wow. That's, that's the difference. And that's so that's why, that's why... This is also why people were like, why are you doing large crowds? Why are you so focused on that? Why are you so focused on everyone speaking? Like, I can't actually make out what that person one kilometer away in other side screaming at the top of their lungs is saying. But just the fact that you know that you can hear them and the fact that you know that they can hear you psychologically changes your relationship with the experience. How distinct are you all in, in that being your focus? It doesn't probably stand very unique well, in that focus uh, relative to maybe other players in the space. We have, um, you know, and this is where obviously I'm, I'm kind of plugging us, but, you know, I, I think sure. I can be pretty confident with some of these statements. Um, we've built a suite of, at this point, production tested technology that is the only platform that has actually consistently run large scale events with, you know, thousands and thousands of people. The metric to think about is operations, operations per second. Per second. I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> my question, because so many people say, oh, I had a, a 10 players or a thousand players. Well, if your players were just pixels, you can have as many players as you like, right? Because they aren't doing anything or interacting in any way, shape or form. What matters is the amount of useful information being exchanged in the world. It's like a budget, like a budget of experience. And you can spend that budget on 10 characters that do very little or do a lot or a thousand characters that do very little, right? And different companies that are doing that. Our number at the moment, you know, something like Fortnite does 10,000 operations a second, which is pretty cool. And they can support a hundred players. Facebook globally with Facebook Messenger handles about a million messages a second. Now it's a very different problem, but just to kind of get numbers in scope and in scale. Mm -hmm. We currently do a billion operations a second. A billion operations a second. We had to, and, and that means whenever you increase that number, everything has to change. So we had to create our own machine learning based rendering algorithm that can custom render every character in different animation states at any distance from where you're standing. We had to invent our own bandwidth compression technology. We had to invent our own testing infrastructure. We had to invent our own backend systems to even be able to understand how these types of systems operate and run. And so when people think of Improbable, they shouldn't think of it as one piece of tech. They should really think of it as a collection of technology and know-how. And we're not stopping there. Like, you know, our goal internally is 10 billion operations a second. Like, I won't be happy until we have 100,000 people. I mean, we can support 15,000 people in a super rich environment right now. I think at 100K, there isn't a stadium on this planet. There isn't like, well, there's some, but you know, there's very few things in this world that require 100,000 people to show up at the same time. It reminds me of Elon Musk talking about how Tesla is actually like 30 companies, or I don't think I think he said seven companies or something in one, because when you're, it sounds like what you're doing is having to build so much from the ground up like, you know, uh, across Completely. different industries. And we'll get into that because you've you've sort of talked about how building for the metaverse is different than building for the internet up to this point has been. And I think it's starting to get at that, like, question of just how many things that have to be built. But on this question of operations per second, I, I wanted to throw an idea out there to you and get your reaction. So from an investing perspective or, or like a, you know, monetary value perspective, what you hear about a lot is Metcalfe's law. And the idea that, you know, the value of Facebook grew exponentially as it's like user base grew where, you know, there's, there's some, you know, correlation basically between the, the value of the business company network, whatever, and the number of users it has, and it grows exponentially with each new user. You're talking about adding new users, but also the capabilities, the amount of like spokes coming out of each of those users in terms of what they can do is also tremendously higher than in like a 2D social media environment. D does that take, does that like exponentialize Metcalf's law? Like when you think about the way value will explode. It does. Yeah, I, I think it does. Look, we choose to live in cities for a reason, right? We choose to go through markets in the real world where you might hear someone singing a song or notice something you didn't imagine. You know, think of your favorite role-playing game or your favorite Dungeons and Dragons campaign. It's all about serendipity and discovery and the interconnection and relationships between things. Like if there was one thing I would emphasize the most, it's that for a metaverse to be valuable, a metaverse is a network of meaning. So it's as valuable as the size of the network, yes, but also as, as the relationships between the things in the network, mm -hmm. right? Let's just take a difference between the Travis Scott concert in Fortnite and the Alexa concert that we did. 
Now, millions of people showed up to see the Travis Scott concert. But actually what happened was there were rooms of 100 people all separated from each other in completely separate instances, watching a pre-recording of Travis Scott, or even if he was there, they, he wasn't able to directly interact with, with any of the fans. It's still awesome. I don't want to throw shade. I mean, it was an incredible event. I loved it. It was really, really cool. But it was more like watching a music video than going to a concert. You know, at a concert, you know, you talk about, were you there? Did you see that crazy dude that was dangling from the ceiling and then, you know, like leapt to one side? Did you see the mosh pit? Did you randomly come across someone? You know, these moments, these these grand gather, gatherings of human beings, they don't happen all the time in a great virtual world or a great uh, network. But the fact that they can happen is an incredibly important element in understanding its value. There's also a very basic economic thing here, which is so many businesses make absolutely no sense unless you can have large scale. For instance, um, celebrities and sporting events, which I focus on quite a lot, you know, if Taylor Swift is showing up and individually meeting rooms of a hundred people, she's going to be here till the age of the universe, you know, before she can hang out with, 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 you know, with, with, with everyone. So you need concentrated groups of people to kind of make this stuff work. Uh, one thing though, worth mentioning when you talk about uh, networks, uh, Net, uh, Metcalf's law is that we're also very focused on the internet of metaverses. So we've called this M squared, but the idea here is that other side is one metaverse among several other metaverses. And by being the technology provider under the hood, we're able to create levels of interoperability that have never been possible before. So you can just take your avatar and instantly move from one world to another, and it'll just work. And you'll just be in a space that can, that can operate the way you hope it to. And that creates even more value because I can make my own business or my own shop and know that what I'm selling will be useful in many worlds. And I think that's kind of been a little bit of the dream for a lot of folks. I mean, this is huge. And this is a huge topic we'll dive into, which is the the dream that those of us in Web3 have, which is that this is a fully interoperable experience in the future. And that's, of course, where the concern around meta comes in, is that that will probably be a closed ecosystem or or just gouge you in, in some capacity. So, and, and actually, maybe let's let's go there. Do, I, I saw you react. Meta, Do you yeah. want to give me your, your thoughts on meta? And then we'll, we'll really dive into this interoperability question. It's, it's, it's interesting because um, there's, we can talk about it morally and we can talk about it economically. And I want to start economically because I think it's almost a stronger argument, right? Which is the big closed platforms like, let's say, YouTube or social media, they work really well because the cost of making content is so low, like pennies to put up a video or a tweet or, I mean, if, if that, like, you know, yeah. given the quality of, of some <laughs> of the stuff, right? But that that cost um, means that I don't care if 80%, 90% of the value is taken by the platform provider, you know, because in reality, if they change their algorithm or ruin my business, and my business is only really worth even at the top, top influencer level, you know, a couple of million dollars a year, you know, you're not going to IPO that business. Fine, we can kind of live with that loss of value. But the metaverse is very, very different. In the metaverse, companies, you know, we talk about user-generated content. What will drive the metaverse is business generated content. You know, those stadiums, those sports, those Taylor Swift concerts, those bazaars, those marketplaces, those massive architectural edifices. Yes, a lot of them will be made by individuals, but a great number of those individuals are going to want to start businesses and seek investment in those businesses. And the problem here is if you are building a business on someone else's closed platform, that business is not attractive to investors. They cannot give you capital because in reality, your business could evaporate tomorrow. It has a ceiling on its growth and on the value that it can capture. It's not just about the fee. The fee could be big or small, and there are many viable options where that can work. It's also about the fact that anything could change at any time. So one of the things we've, we've tried to do is take a completely opposite view to not just Facebook, but also Epic and also Roblox, which is we're building a network where Although we are providing some of the key technology, the network outlives us and makes decisions eventually that we even, even we can't reverse. And it tries to guarantee as much stability as possible on the basic rules of the network. The other thing I'd, I'd point out is that a lot of the big internet companies that, that I come out of what I kind of call the dark ages mm. of the internet, which we're sort of leaving right now. You know, we have these feudal kings who basically like rule these areas. And if you're not among one of them, like you're kind of screwed. These feudal kings, they take a huge toll. And as a result, they depress the ability for new innovation to happen. They used to be good for innovation, but now they've become a problem for innovation. Mm. So moving away from that model to more of a network where value can be shared and where very small fees are needed at the bottom, all the value goes up to the top as well. Like a small um, small anecdote I'd throw in is, you know, Bill Gates, of all people, famously, um, did not want a fee 
for an app store or for Windows or for or for applications to run on top. Because he said the value shouldn't be at the operating system level. The value should be in the applications. It's funny how like now we're used to the idea of you know paying 30% to, to an Apple app store. But when you think about it, back in the day, obviously things have changed now, but back in the day, the idea was to create an op- like to kind of encourage the content creators to get as rich as possible, uh, which is a big part of how these networks need to operate. So if you don't follow this model, you have to pay everybody for content. If you do follow this model, people pay you for content. And that's a much, much better mm-hmm. way to, uh, to function. I'm curious too, how much, you know, you're, you're saying we can stomach the loss of value that comes from, you know, because the biggest content creators are making millions, but there are businesses that were built upon Facebook or Google and and built upon their ad system and and getting in front of those billions of people that are pretty big. So I I almost feel like it's, it's maybe partly that it was amount of business that we could feel comfortable losing, but also just ignorance. And we're not so ignorant anymore. Like, like we've all now learned and so we just can't stomach it moving forward to some extent. Yeah. But a lot of those businesses ended up dying because the platform copied their features and used its dominant position to just absorb the business almost all the profit itself is sucked up by the platform. Like the the actual mm-hmm. value being created by an awesome YouTube creator is a lot more than the value that they can take out, which means that they can't reinvest that value. So yes, there are businesses that have that have on the monolithic platform survived and prospered. And some of these platforms are like multi-billion user platforms. But when we're building the metaverse from scratch, you can't really make that argument. You know, there's like mm. 2,000 people in Sandbox and Decentraland. You know, we're not at the stage yet where, yeah. you know, where, where we're going to be. Where we're gonna you be can doing. have that kind of power. You don't have the leverage. Exactly. These platforms don't and have the leverage. Facebook, Facebook's main challenge is the hubris of imagining they can recreate what Apple did. And what Apple did was only possible because of a confluence of luck, opportunity, and circumstance that led to that level of centralization. Like, I just don't see that happening ever again um, because of the nature of collaboration required to go do it. And this is also why I'm such a big Web3 proponent, right? Crypto and Web3, forget all the consumer use cases like NFTs and, and tokens and all the good and the bad that comes from that. The B2B use cases are profound. This lets businesses share value and share a platform's value much simpler than having one of us own it or another one own it. That's the power because it lets all of us invest more in, in what those in what those businesses could be. It, it, let me see if I have what you're saying there right. Like the, the reason this is so powerful from a B2B level, I just did an interview with um, an SVP at Turner Sports, right? And, and he oh, seems awesome. genuinely quite excited about the idea of really being in co-creation with the fans of the sport leagues that are their partners and that those fans will both get value from, from that co-creation and then imbue value into the network because of that co-creation. And while on the surface that feels anth- antithetical or, or scary to these historically centralized business models because it feels like you're maybe getting less value, the idea is that tremendously more value, the pie is going to be so much bigger that that everyone will end up better off, including the, the centralized or, you know, Turner themselves will probably have more value they'll get out of this because the pie is just bigger. Is is that essentially what you're getting at there? Yes. I do believe the pie will be much, much bigger and that'll mean all the services will do better. But I do think some of the existing large tech companies are going to be very challenged, including large game companies. Like, so let's just take an example here, right? If you were previously in the position of just selling people skins and items, which they could not resell or financialize in any way, shape or form, then you're making money from that that basically goes down when those people start being able to resell those items Mm -hmm. or even ditch the investment they've made in your ecosystem for a different one. So it's not necessarily immediately good for you. Long term, it's great because more players are willing to invest because their investment is safer. They can take it from from one place to another. So that's kind of an example. The the other small thing I'd add is... um, you know, I talk a little bit about this in kind of the tyrant and the comments part of, of, of my book, but these large companies are just databases in a sense. They're databases with a fee, right? Like if you want to access the social graph of Facebook, you pay the fee. If you want to access the buyers and sellers and products of Amazon, you pay a fee. If you want to access just information on the internet, you pay a fee to Google. And these databases with fees on top make it very difficult for companies to collaborate on building fundamental services. But if Web3 can let us take those databases and make them owned by everyone, then the value doesn't accumulate in the kind of database gatekeeper. It accumulates at the application level. And that's what we should all be pushing for. So I totally agree and love that. And I think that's what we all should be pushing for. You you were mentioning these like incredible opportunities on a business level. And those seem uh, like antithetical to one another, right? So that's what I'm trying to push at is to, to get a little bit more clarity on where you think the the value is oh, sure. on the I mean, B2B I, I basically level. Think- Sure. So let's let's imagine that um, you're a company that wants to provide um, a marketplace for virtual objects, right? 
you have a really good idea of how you're going to buy, allow people to buy, sell, and discover virtual objects. You're going to help creators rank those objects, and companies think about that. In the way that we're architecting the M squared, and let's say before M squared, that marketplace would just get owned by whatever company ran the platform. That's how it would work. You know, that they would just completely own every aspect of it, and that's how it would work. What we're now able to do is to go, okay, you know what? The marketplace could be powered by an underlying database or set of SDKs, which are owned by the network, and all token holders can share in the value of that, and then anyone can build a marketplace. And so marketplaces can compete, right? And the competing marketplaces, they can innovate in ways that are not really possible when one company dominates owning that kind of, that kind of element. I mean, maybe you or I could build a better version of a Facebook Messenger or a WhatsApp Messenger, but we'd have to start we're, from scratch. Yeah, we've never been, we'll never be given that chance. They'll buy us out long <laughs> before, or litigate us out long before we get there. <laughs> And that's really dumb because actually all those all those messages, all those users, they're ours. You know, those social relationships, that information, that actually is ours. I mean, in any moral, in any moral sense. I think the other big problem with the sort of tyrannical tech company ruling everything is you can see and this is kind of to be fair to Facebook, because they've they've had a really um, they've made some mistakes, obviously, but they've also had a really been put in a very difficult position. They have to act with the authority of a government over, mm. over a group of people as large as the largest countries on earth. But they have no mandate to act on behalf of those people, sure. right? Because those people have not voted for them or enfranchised them in any way, shape, or form. So any decision they make is the wrong one. Because why do you get why do you get to make this decision? Networks with voting and DAOs and the opportunity for these networks to provide not just financial ownership but actually decision making power to creators, merchants, and users, as we want to do with M squared. That's very different. Like if 10 million people on M squared who are all working inside metaverses, they voted on something. Like let's say in the, far, in the future, they could vote on you know, how they feel a minimum wage might work for metaverse workers, right? Everybody kind of has to live with that. Even governments have to respect you know, democratic processes involving millions of people. There are countries in the UK that are smaller. I mean, in, in, the, in Europe, sorry, that are, that are smaller than just a few million people. You know, so these can be very, very powerful entities if you trust the community, if you enfranchise the community. CoinShift is a leading treasury management and infrastructure platform for DAOs and crypto businesses who need to manage their treasury operations. Every crypto org needs to manage their treasury, and CoinShift offers a simple, flexible, and efficient multi-chain treasury management platform built on top of the extremely secure Gnosis Safe. With CoinShift, your organization can go from primitive single-chain treasuries to expressive, flexible, multi-chain features such as global user management, global contracts, proposal management, and many other features that can be shared across an entire organization. CoinShift layers on powerful treasury management tools on top of the proven security of Gnosis Safe, allowing users to save time and reduce operational burdens and gas costs. CoinShift even has data tools like account reporting across the seven chains on which it operates. Used by industry powerhouses such as Uniswap Grants, Balancer, Consensus, and Mazari, CoinShift is speeding up the coordination and efficiency of the organizations that use it. In DeFi, you have to keep up with the frontier, and CoinShift makes that easy. So sign up at coinshift.xyz slash bankless. Did you know that you can buy crypto directly on almost any blockchain using MetaMask? We all use MetaMask on Ethereum, but did you know you can buy all the popular assets across all the popular chains straight from the MetaMask mobile wallet? Did you know that you could do this from over 260 available regions? So now you know that MetaMask helps you buy over 90 cryptocurrencies using bank cards, credit cards, Apple Pay, Google Pay for whenever you need some quick crypto, whether you're stranded without gas or you just need that NFT or you want to tinker with some new application. MetaMask saves you time and gas costs by buying your favorite crypto asset straight from the mobile wallet. So check it out at metamask.io slash buy hyphen crypto. Let's, let's talk um, the, the two kind of pieces of technology that I feel like Improbable is, is well known for right now are N-squared and Morpheus. Can you explain those two, their interaction, and this will really get us to the, the interoperability stuff that I think is so, oh. so, so critical. So in order to, um, so Morpheus is essentially a suite of ever evolving tools that allow you to build really compelling experiences that are not possible today in traditional game engines or tools. The big headline thing is, yes, you can have thousands of people all in one space, but you can do so much more than that. You can have physics with thousands of people and objects all in a dense environment. You can use any streaming solution. Like we've got partners like Google Stream, but you can use others too and stream out your world. So a single link click lets you jump into the world. You can download and operate a client on a mobile with tiny amounts of bandwidth. You can have everyone speak with our voice solution. You can render everything on screen with our rendering plugins that allow for this. You can easily author content and build worlds or virtual objects using open standards that we're publishing that are going to be a key part of how you create content within this world. So Morpheus is all about empowering the experiences. And why that's important is that 
if a metaverse doesn't provide an experience I can't get in a video game, why am I there, right? Like, why am I there? And in the end, like, the, the, you have to have differentiated experiences. M squared is different. M squared is going, okay, how do we actually provide the key services that allow a metaverse to exist, have commerce, have identity, have virtual objects, have all of the data that's necessary, some data on chain, because it should be on chain, some data off chain, because no chain can really support running it yet. All of that information and all of the SDKs and tools that allow you to kind of build your own metaverse and plug in, and also the um, the kind of things that create the right level of governance and token economy around that, that is M squared. M squared is like our kind of level one internet of metaverses. And it's designed to be multi-chain to interface with all of the existing chain ecosystems. And it's designed to really bridge each world you might want to build with other kinds of businesses that could work into that as well. So with M squared, you know, you could build your own metaverse. You could build a business that serves metaverses. You could build a marketplace. You could do all of those things. Things that would traditionally all be owned by one company, we want to encourage many companies to go and do. Really and of course, making we'll it open well source. You're, it's, it's, exactly. It's, we'll, be, we'll be open sourcing as much of it as we can. Um, and partly to create additional confidence in the way that the way that the system operates, and it's gonna it's gonna feel and be governed and be run a lot like um, blockchain projects that are out there now. To be categorically clear, we're not we're not we don't think we need to actually focus on something like building a level one to support that. There are already lots of great level one chains that we can leverage, but we do need to create some higher level abstractions that make all of this make sense. Like, how do I describe an object so I can take it from one game to another? That's a big problem that we're that we'll be publishing uh, answers to. I, I hope later this year actually. So would it be right for me to say, okay, Morpheus is this very specific set of tools that, you know, other side, for example, wants to pick and choose and a la carte which ones they think are really important for the world exactly. they're building in the, in the short term. And then M squared is like a set of standards and, and like a protocol, like a, essentially like that it can. Exactly. Yeah. It's like a network of worlds and it allows you to buy, sell and move virtual objects between worlds. It creates consistency between those worlds, and it's like a it's like an internet of metaverses. That's how mm -hmm. I would describe it. And I heard you say something that struck me as really significant, which is that all of the partners that you're working with, and maybe we'll get into some of the other projects you've worked on, but um, as, as part of working with y'all, they are contractually obligated to uh, say that it, that anybody who has a character or, or does something in that world has the legal right to take their items or their character exactly. out of one metaverse into another. So if I'm exactly. in other side and something gets built, I can take that into any other world that's within this M squared network. Exactly. There are some really specific rules on, it's almost a bit like the European Union. There's freedom of movement, <laughs> there's freedom of commerce, there's the ability for you to think things around. And like, so, so that basically means that you can build a small world or an experience and have the confidence of attracting users from any of these big projects, right? And vice versa, you might build something really cool and think, you know, I want to make that part of other side. You can do that too, right? So mm -hmm. this is very, very different from how existing um, businesses in this space operate. And we really believe in it because mm -hmm. if people are willing to agree, if the biggest partners are already willing to agree, the smallest partners have to, to kind of join the network and to be mm -hmm. part of it. So you'll soon be able to take, you know, from a sporting event into a concert, into a game, you know, the same asset. Will there be, how, how many winners will there be here? And I, I say that like, you know, for, from a consumer level, to me, the, the benefit would be that all of the metaverses that get built use M squared, right? So that they can all, so that I can do anything I want across all of the worlds. Is that how this plays out where there's sort of one primary winner because then all of the network effects can accrue? But again, it doesn't feel negative the way it happens with yeah. Facebook because it's open standard. Exactly. That's what I hope for. And, and when that happens, it won't just be us that win in that. Every single citizen, user, business, and person, you know, everybody will have access to, for example, tokens to, to share in the value, the ability to build new businesses on top with the confidence of what that service is providing them. It's a little bit like a government, but one that's actually like kind of, you know, on on <laughs> on chain and in code mm -hmm. and, and, and operating in a way that, that hopefully really supports uh, where people need to go. So yeah, those will be the winners. Um, and so that's, that's also why we raised a big fund um, into the M squared fund, into the M squared entity, which uh, we happened earlier this year, so that we can even support projects that want to kind of grow and be part of the network. That's the ideal is to, to have it all in one. Do you think that's realistic or do you think there become two or three or like how many winners do you think emerge in this space? So um, one of the reasons that we are primarily focused on non-gaming companies right now, we're focused on Web3 businesses like Yuga, um, people within sport, fashion, music and beyond is because they generally are building and want to build experiences that are massively enhanced by Morpheus, but also 
they want the freedom to kind of build their own businesses. They don't want to be part of somebody else's platform. They want to stay in that platform. And they're willing to interoperate because they already interoperate. You know, a fashion brand already interoperates with uh, UEFA because I can bring my clothes into a football match in the real world, right? Whereas trying to make, you know, uh, trying to bring a uh, Halo Master Chief's machine gun into Harry mm. Potter land is a world kind of a problem, right? You know, you know it, it, it just doesn't make sense. You know, I mean, Voldemort can't deal with a machine gun. It's not fair <laughs> on him. It's not fair on the whole school. So, you know, there isn't really any notion it's of interoperability. It's not fair on the whole school. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just, you know, I feel Master Chief would have solved the problem way quicker. You know, let the kids figure it out. You know, it's, it's what they were there for. But anyway, the, the, point, the point is... Um, <laughs> the, the, the point is, um, you know, we talk about interoperability, but it's much more than technical interoperability. There have to be commercial and creative incentives that create interoperability. And our real culture already interoperates, right? So focusing on those things is important. Now, I do think games will emerge, but those games will be pretty cool and unusual compared to the games of today. Kind of like the games people are going to build with the other side SDK, because those games can be built from the get-go in an environment where all the objects and assets can be NFTs can move between worlds, can rely upon content and behavior from other spaces. So you might see some really quirky new genres or formats emerging. And, and I really believe that's the direction. Mm. I think the traditional games industry, honestly, is going, I mean, and I should say this is, you know, we're, we're probably the largest provider of sort of multiplayer expertise into the industry. We have a service business that does that. We work with 60 publishers. We built um, the multiplayer mode of Fall Guys, if people have played that. Um, we work with loads of different uh, companies in the space. What we find is that they're amazing. They know what they're doing and they're building great games, but it's not really in their interest today to turn games into metaverse experiences or to start involving crypto because all those things just create risk for them and they only create opportunities for value to maybe go into other systems. And that's not the case with uh, with, with big cultural mm. institutions. So I think we can sign up and work with the right partners here. We might make a network that, you know, maybe it won't be the, the you know, maybe it won't be certain to be the winning network, but it'll suddenly be an important one. What would the process be or need to be for those games to, to ultimately become more like metaverse experiences and more interoperable? Like, will we get there and it's just a matter of time or you're not sure we'll ever get there? I think it's like mobile. You know, there are still game developers today inside major studios who don't like mobile games or who don't mm. like free-to-play games or who think that's not the way we did things back in my day. You know, the games industry is at, on the one hand incredibly innovative and on the other hand, it's as conservative as like a medieval blacksmith. You know, like <laughs> we've done things this way for years and, and for good reason because games are so much about risk. You invest vast amounts of money and they often fail that conservatism is a good attitude when you're doing, mm -hmm. um, you know, AAA and high-end game development. So I think we're going to need companies like, the, you know, the supercells of Web3, companies that start from the beginning with a mindset and, and a thinking that is built around the idea of building games and content in interoperable worlds. Here's one kind of quirky one for you, right? Traditionally, what matters is how many users you have and retain in your world. It matters a lot less, though, when you're selling virtual objects that can technically be used in any world. Like, let's say I make like a, a Rocket League clone and I have a really cool set of skins that I want to give out to people. It turns out the skins are really popular, but the game sucks, right? Actually, my revenue might still be awesome because people are using those skins in other games. That's a mindset that just hasn't come into the games industry yet. I think you're getting at something important there. And tell me if I'm right on this, which is the economics of the metaverse benefiting off of long-term engagement as opposed to like quick outrage culture. It, it, do I have something right there? And can you speak to that? Because sure. if that's true, that feels like huge because no, I think absolutely. such a central woe of our lives mm -hmm. today is the outrage culture generated by social media and those incentives. This is maybe the biggest difference in my sort of metaverse philosophy from folks. Um, I have a lot of respect, for example, for Matthew Ball, who writes really great stuff about the metaverse, but probably one of the bigger, maybe not even differences, but emphasis changes in how I think and he thinks and how a lot of people in the games industry think about the metaverse is that we have to dig very deep into why people value these experiences. This is something I think a lot about in my book. These experiences are not valuable simply because they're entertaining. They're valuable because they're fulfilling. And fulfillment is the key to long-term engagement and fulfillment cannot be faked. I'll give you an example, right? 
in order for me to get my feeling of competence when playing tennis, let's say, right? I have to have a certain win rate. If I continuously lose every single game that I play, I'm just like, I, I don't actually know how to play tennis at all. So if I were to go to Wimbledon and lose every single game, um, it would be very disheartening and I wouldn't want to carry on playing tennis. Well, the average person wouldn't want to carry on playing tennis unless you were kind of a masochist, right? Game developers figured out that you need kind of a 70% win rate right? You need to, mm. you can't win every game. You certainly can't lose every game either. You need to be in a flow state of challenge. And what's really interesting about that flow state of challenge is during that, that flow state, you're, you're learning. Your brain is actually working in a beneficial and healthy way that is growing your experience of life. Like nobody would say, you know, Max Verstappen is addicted to F1. They'd say he's really great at it. And he's, you know, grown and can probably, we'd love to talk to him and learn from him about like how he thinks about F1, right? In various ways. So the, the the beautiful thing is that in order to retain people to experiences that actually they want to pay for and they want to be part of, they have to be provided with some sort of unique fulfillment or they just won't show up and they just won't pay. And the other really great thing is because we can charge for virtual objects, because every business can tangibly charge for digital assets, and this is the magic of the Web3 revolution, we don't need ads. I mean, you can still have ads, but ads mm -hmm. don't have to be the center. Attention doesn't have to be the center of the economy. And that frees you from extremely toxic business models. The other flip side of this, um, you know, wh how do the business models become better that I, would, that I would kind of throw in is that a lot of things become viable for individuals to do to make money that didn't make sense before. Like anybody can have a creative profession as a moderator, as a content creator, even as a player. Like Play to Earn has gotten like um, a lot of bad uh, rap recently, but I think people should take a look a little bit at free to play because free to play might sound good, but what free to play really is, is that the 99% of people who like, let's say play Halo um, Infinite or play Call of Duty online, those people have a job and their job is to be shot by the people who've paid money. That is their job. <laughs> they are literally there in cannon fodder. Like if those people were not there, then the people that pay money would not show up because there's no one to match make with. So you're already doing play to earn. You're just doing it for free, right? You know, so you, you're, you're already contributing to the success of games. And if we can start to incentivize people, then we can have bartenders in virtual bars who are actually there at certain hours of the day. We could have guards in cities that, that you know, actually catch the thieves at certain times, you know, and I think that is actually really exciting and grows the the complexity of the experiences and therefore their fulfillment, uh, you know, across the world of, of, of the metaverse. I'm not sure I'm persuaded, though, that it will. And, and maybe this wasn't ever the, the promise. Right. But it, it's not going to entirely eliminate the the incentives that we still have in Web2 or in social media, say, to like generate outrage because it, it keeps people around longer to buy more goods. Even if, if, if it's not trying to keep people around longer so you can monetize your ad partner, like you still want to be competing for people's attention and that can still involve these addictive notifications and it can still involve crazy headlines yeah. or crazy behaviors. I, I, I guess, I mean, I would say there's a, there's a reason why we use the phrase rage quitting in gaming, right? Because mm. I got to angry that I quit. Well, that's not good for the game developer, right? Interesting. You know, I, you know, retention is very, very important in game design and in online game design. And retention often requires the direct addressing of toxicity. The other thing that I'd say is when two people are arguing over whatever it is, you know, American politics, vaccines, insert your hot button topic, um, you know, on mm -hmm. Facebook, th their incentives are really just to create a compelling argument with one another. When two people are on an adventure in a role playing game and their job is to slay a dragon, they have a tangible need to work together and are bonded mm. together by that experience in a way that is very different from arguing with someone over something. You know, there's a reason why so many romances, apparently, I was reading, start with people who like go on journeys together or end up sitting next to each other in planes or things of that nature. Like shared experiences, whether adverse or positive, they create bonds between people. They don't divide people. And social mm -hmm. media just doesn't provide experiences, really. It provides content, endless, never-ending content, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, all it can really do is affect us in a very, very superficial way. Yeah. I, I was just thinking, I wish more people rage quit social media. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, people, <laughs> Wouldn't that be lovely if we'd be like, rage quit Twitter? I'm not going to send this mean tweet. I'm going to rage quit. <laughs> no, completely. And I think I, I think social media is a great example where, um, you know, while, of course, we look at a lot of the negatives there as being structural, there are also, it's also very important to mention that it didn't have to be this way. You know, there are other ways we could have constructed social media that wouldn't have resulted in this degenerate mess. You know, look at Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a free service where everyone contributes content. Wikipedia is generally accurate. It's generally good, right? And it has way, 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 way less budget than Facebook. So why is Wikipedia able to prevent, you know, outright lies from showing up, you know, on a regular basis, but Facebook isn't? 
it's not a lack of ability. It's a genuine decision to create a platform that generates the most money by creating the most outrage. You, you were speaking a little bit earlier to how strategic you've been about picking partners. I'm curious, how did the Yuga partnership come to be and uh, what excited you about that? Well, I would credit uh, Guy Osiri as the person who introduced mm. us. And he had the foresight to see that there was a great combination between the technology that um, that we had and the vision we had for M2 and the vision that the Yuga Labs team has. Nicole, the CEO there, is incredible. And, and, and you know, and Gordon and Gaga and all the founders, they're, they're, they don't get enough credit for their vision, which is so much more expansive than just building another video game. You know, they, they're actually trying to make a real economy of experiences, which fits so well with what we had intended that we've actually ended up in a relationship, which I, hopefully, you know, seems like the, the community is happy with so far, where we're delivering value together and building other side, like Improbable is, the, is kind of the game developer of other side, as well as being the technology provider. But we're also working together to think about the M Square network. You know, how should that work? How does that help other side, but also create value for other experiences in other worlds? So they've kind of been a dream partner, um, you know, to date. And one of our most important responsibilities is delivering for them. What are the biggest challenges they're going to face? I mean, it strikes me that they're they're balancing so many interests there, both like how do you make sure that with this land and, and that there'll be resources on the land that one group doesn't end up with way too many resources that ruin sort of the gameplay experience. And like of all of the various interests they're trying to balance, making sure the landholders are happy, but also I... Uh, presumably making sure that it's, it becomes accessible for more people. Like, what's the biggest challenge you think that they face and you face? The biggest challenge, um, well, let's first think ah. about what they have going for them. They have, well, we have together um, the best community in Web3, in my opinion, you know, in terms of scale, just the sheer level of enthusiasm, the incredible quality of derivative experiences that have come out of it as well. So they have an incredible brand, so much so that so, you know, that many major brands are you know, engaging in partnering. They have ApeCoin. They have a currency that's sort of, even in the downturn, sort of doing okay and, and holding up and has a lot of really interesting partnerships and, and possibilities that'll power the world. They also have kind of the only actual delivered metaverse experience, even with first trip, that remotely lives up to the promises and expectations that people have made in the space. And I hope if you've, if you've not seen it, you should check out the videos. If you were there, even more awesome. We're going to try to get more people into them. But the reaction from that has been okay, I get what the metaverse is for now, right? I get I get why I want to be here and why I want to be part of that experience. I mean, they had live actors playing characters inside live world events for thousands of players for the first time in history. They had thousands of people speaking for the first time in history. They had a world where you could kind of influence You're it. saying they, but it's really you. <laughs> No, it's, 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 a, it's a we. Well, it's, it's a yeah. we. Like, um, you know, the technology, the technology and the game development services that we provide are important, but I don't want anyone to downplay just how visionary the Yuga Labs team are. Mm -hmm. You know, these are creative ideas. We've, we've worked on them together and we've learned a lot from them and, and hopefully they from us, but it's a collaboration, a genuine collaboration mm -hmm. on a level that I'm, that I'm, I, have, I rarely find, uh, you know, we, we, we kind of talk all the time and engage all the time, but I will say, um, you know, those things mean that Yes, there are problems in balancing. There are going to be problems in managing the economy and keeping people happy. The land mint maybe wasn't that you know the, the most you know the greatest thing ever, but the the reality is they're just so we're just so far ahead of of, of other projects in this space. You know, there could be that there is an interest generally in building Web three metaverses. Maybe there isn't a market to the extent that we all believe there is, but if there is one, I struggle to see any other project out there that's even a tenth of where of, of where of, of where they are and and the. That combination combined with a unique community, I think, is dynamite. How, is there a way for us to, to to probe or test that what the appetite for this is, other than investing billions of dollars to, to build all these metaverses? <laughs> well, I'll say, look, we've run we've run many events. Some have been less public than the first trip one. You know, K-pop concerts, events in our in our game scavengers where we did scav lab. We've done a number of other test events. We've we've surveyed the crap out of thousands and thousands of people. We've watched. I've mm. performed myself. I've observed the behavior and seen it. And I'm incredibly encouraged. Like people stay not just till the end of these things, they stay well past them. They react with visceral emotion to interacting with live performers at scale. They also consistently say the same thing, which is I can't have this anywhere else. I can't have this experience anywhere else. So mm. I think it's only human nature to, to be thrilled and excited with the idea of being present with lots of other people. I, th I think there's there's quite clearly a market for that. And if we look at sports, music, all the other different already understood areas where this works, bringing them into a Web3 environment can only can only be more compelling, in, in my view. Still, there's a lot to prove. Um, you know, it's not, it's not a success till it's a success. And I think there's a journey we're going on. And I think going on that journey with the users in a very public way, you know, two months or three months from announcement to you can actually play the thing, that beats most MMOs by several years. 
we only have a couple minutes left here. So, but I, I do want to just touch on as we think about interoperability. So where else folks maybe who are a part of this other side experience could take their assets now or in the future? And uh, like, what are the other projects you're working on? And, and again, you've worked with governments and, and militaries. I'd love to just a little bit sure. unpack what so, that means. So there, there are a lot of other projects that um, we're, we're, we're kind of a little bit um, almost swamped now with opportunity, which is so exciting. But there are also other things in the works that we'd like to announce more um, soon. I can't talk about them until they're public, but I will say there'll be a healthy grouping of worlds that hopefully will uh, will will create value for everyone um on the government stuff yeah so there's a um there's a separate subsidiary to improbable um which is focused and has been for a long time on really important problems that involve everything from like how to model climate uh, related issues to coronavirus modeling to large scale simulation and helping governments think about security challenges including some of the topical stuff in the world today we're really proud of that work, and it is an offshoot of our early technology that is about making massive simulations, but massive simulations that can actually like, answer questions about the real world. We're going to be a lot more public about that later this year, um, and there is some stuff out there, but it's it's very, very different and quite separate from our metaverse and gaming efforts, but kind of comes from a common technical lineage. That's fascinating to me, and I, I know we have to go, but I... I... I'm reading a book right now called The Bomber Mafia about uh, like the first bomb site, the Norden bomb site, which was built, you know, before World War II and was supposed to make these really accurate bombs drop. And it took the wind pressure and the, you know, all the things. And then in reality, it really didn't work that well because there was just way too many factors that you yeah. couldn't really predict or know that made it so that the technology really didn't work. And I, I, like my instinct is I want to feel like, how can you it model does situations... Leave. We use a hundred companies worth of simulations and models that are mm. proven through breakthroughs in how you propagate like model accuracy and error. We sped up coronavirus modeling in the UK by 10,000 times using the technological scale. We're actively being used by governments in real security problems and issues today. These aren't demos. These are sort of production use technologies. And the team have worked really hard to work with government over many years to devise this stuff. And the need for this is just incalculable. Like right yeah. now today, if you want to model an entire city, the power grid, the telecommunications network, the way that people operate, and you need to, because if you want to electrify that city, how do you know what the unintended consequences of doing it are? In one case, we did a simulation and it turns out the whole power grid blows up if you have too many electric cars, <laughs> which was not clear. Like, in another case, we showed there were security vulnerabilities nobody imagined because the people that built the roads and the people that built the telecoms never really understood how the two things related in the way that they thought they did. Examples like that abound. So these are known as kind of complex adaptive systems. And this is the other side of the metaverse, you know? Well, which oh, is no, pun intended. Kind of metaverse, <laughs> around, but, you know, the metaverse is a little bit about fulfillment and entertainment, but it's also allowed about, you know, communities and governments, you know, making decisions and choices together in a better way. And we're going to do more later this year to cleanly separate the kind of communication and narrative around these two things because that business has also matured enormously. It has its own kind of leadership team. So, you know, we, we'd like to let that come out of the limelight a little bit more. But yeah, there's there's more to improbable even than the metaverse work that people have had of. Okay. Well, I have to let you go, but will you come back? Because I feel like there was so much I didn't even get it to get to get into with you. And uh, this am, is am, so I'm fascinating. Sure, I'm sure we will get the opportunity. So yeah, it was been it's been a lot of okay. fun. So thank you very much. Awesome.